Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Scott Melbourne and I am the Executive Director of the Schneider Museum of Art, part of the Oregon Center for the Arts here at Southern Oregon University. Please note that we have you all on mute and please stay on mute until the end of the talk. If you have any questions, please type those into the chat or save them for the end of the talk. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our special guest, Sue Taylor. Sue Taylor is an art historian, curator, and critic, and professor emerita of art history at Portland State University. Her essays and exhibition of book reviews have appeared in American Art, American Craft, Art in America, Art Journal, Art News, Art US, Chicago Sun Times, Dialogue, Fiber Arts, New Art Examiner, and The Oregon Arts Watch. She is the author of numerous catalog essays and of two monographs, Hans Belmer, The Anatomy of Anxiety from MIT Press in 2000, and Grant Wood's Secrets, University of Delaware Press in 2020. Please join me in welcoming Sue Taylor. Hi, Sue. Welcome, Sue. I've made you a co-host uh, so that you may share your screen whenever you are ready. Thank you, Scott. I'm so happy for the chance to share some thoughts on abstraction on the occasion of this important exhibition. It's exciting to see so many artists engaging with the tradition of abstract painting and other mediums, especially at a moment when one senses a certain anxiety about the status of this kind of work a concern that I addressed briefly in my catalog essay. It seems that art today is everywhere under pressure to serve some political cause, be it Black Lives Matter, environmentalism, gender identity politics, and so on. Last May, I corresponded with the artists that Mel Press had selected for inclusion in this exhibition. And one of them, unprompted by me, explained in an email, quote, given our current socio-political environment, I often feel like I'm not doing enough with my work, end quote. An uneasy feeling, unfortunate from my point of view, that he had to overcome in order to pursue the ideas that genu genuinely interested him in the studio. And that's just one random example of what seems to be a widespread sentiment among abstract artists and even some of their supporters. In September, a month before Sensei Objects was about to open, I received an announcement for a show called Social Abstraction, featuring artwork by six artists putatively offering political truths, positions on environmental degradation and affordable housing, and a vision of a more just future. All of it, very handsome work to be sure, but from my point of view, hardly supporting the claims made for it in the press release, claims that constitute another kind of defensive pleading that Frank Stella suggested in the 1980s did abstract art a great disservice. The argument to which Stella objected was for the supposed spiritual import of abstraction. Nowadays, the pleading is for its political relevance. I want to take a position against this kind of apology for abstraction because it implies that abstract art is insufficient in and of itself. In 1885, James Whistler delivered his famous 10 o'clock lecture in London, railing against critics, art historians, academicians, 
all of those who made demands on art, demands for truth, for moral uplift, for patriotic affirmations. Art, Whistler asserted, should never be required to respond to the question, what good shall it do? His impassioned defense of art's autonomy was possible in the late 19th century because of certain historical developments, including the rise of bourgeois individualism and art's separation from its previous functions in religious or courtly agendas. Whistler's belief in art's total independence was the unequivocal principle of an aesthete who loved blue and white porcelain and designed a peacock room, but it was also the position of the great 20th century revolutionary Leon Trotsky, who proclaimed it from exile in 1938, even as he dodged the bullets of Stalin's hired assassins. In Mexico, Trotsky collaborated on a manifesto towards a free revolutionary art with the surrealist poet and fellow communist Andre Breton. Diego Rivera was a signatory. Against the background of Nazi abuse of modern art as degenerate and Stalin's suppression of art that did not serve the state, Trotsky and Breton argued for the complete independence and freedom of art. The opposition of writers and artists is one of the forces they hoped, which can usefully contribute to the discrediting and overthrow of regimes that are destroying, along with the right of the proletariat to aspire to a better world, every sentiment of nobility and even of human dignity. How is this discrediting to be done? Trotsky would not issue prescriptions, but instead trusted every individual artist to give his own inner world incarnation in art, asserting that the imagination must under no pretext allow itself to be placed under bonds. The free choice of themes, Trotsky declared, the absence of all restrictions on the range of his explorations, the artist has a right to claim these as inalienable. 1938 was of course a time of great social and political turmoil. Picasso in response had created Guernica the year before, deeply informed by his own earlier synthetic cubist in inventions, as well as by careful studies of Goya and Rubens. At the same time, the anti-fascist activist Ad Reinhardt was painting abstractions in New York, and the exiled Bauhaus modernist Joseph Albers was introducing color theory to students at Black Mountain College in what he called significantly free studies. The Trotskyist Clement Greenberg was writing avant-garde and kitsch, published the following year in the Partisan Review. Greenberg understood, and Adorno later explained in his book on aesthetic theory, that modern art had indeed gained the potential for autonomy, had become a set of self-determining practices with its own evolving methods and materials formed at every moment by its own previous history. In 1938, Sigmund Freud had fled Vienna in the face of the German Anschluss taken refuge in London. 
I suggested in my catalog essay how psychoanalytic theories might have some explanatory implications for abstract art and its viewers, and I'd like to elaborate on that in the time remaining today. Freud's contributions to our understanding of the visual arts is limited, albeit fascinating. He believed that the artist presents the contents of his or her unconscious in a symbolic way, the model here being the dream, and that psychoanalysis could help us understand the latent content of the work of art. In the 23 volumes of his collected writings, we find only two essays on visual art, both on Renaissance figures that he profoundly admired. He relied on a psychobiographical approach in his study of Leonardo, positing the significance for the artist of having had, as an infant, an unwed birth mother, and when he was taken into the home of his father, a stepmother, two mothers in effect, confusion that later impacted his unusual depiction of the virgin and child with St. Anne. In his essay on the Moses of Michelangelo, Freud performed a detailed iconographic reading of the sculpture, trying to determine which moment in the biblical text Michelangelo had tried to render. I realize I don't do these two essays justice by trying to summarize them in just two sentences. Note, however, that the essays date to 1910 and 1914, respectively. The very moment uh, at which Kandinsky in Munich made the leap into abstraction and published concerning the spiritual in art. Freud ignored this momentous development in the same way that he neglected his contemporaries, Klimt, Schiele, and Kokoschka in Vienna. We can't fault him for this. He was not an art critic, but focused on helping his patients, refining his theories, and establishing psychoanalysis as a discipline. He admitted that he was not an expert in art and that he had no feeling for its formal aspects, only an interest in subject matter. I think he spoke for many art historians and critics, though, when he explained why he was motivated to write about the Michelangelo sculpture that he felt compelled to return to again and again in Rome. Quote, some rationalistic turn of mind in me rebels against being moved by a thing without knowing why, end quote. Kandinsky was a theosophist, and for him and other spiritually minded artists, including Hilma of Klint, Malevich, and Mondrian, Mystical explanations about the power and value of abstract art were sufficient. Freud, on the other hand, as a rational materialist, could never have fallen back on ideas about pure essences or vibrations in the soul. He came to recognize, in his words, the apparently paradoxical fact that precisely some of the grandest and most overwhelming creations of art are still unsolvable riddles to our understanding. Still, we puzzle over that paradox and may, like Freud, rebel against being moved without knowing why. It's not enough, at least for me, to look at a work of art, register an astonishing sense of wonder or joy pronounce the thing amazing and move on. There remains always a need to figure out not just how the object was made, although that can be a satisfying project in itself, 
but why the object seems so intriguing. We still want to discover, even if it hardly seems possible, the reason for the work's singular effect. And here's a strange thing. Philosopher Stanley Cavell observed in 1965 that, quote, objects of art do not merely interest and absorb us. We are not merely involved with them, but concerned with them and care about them. We treat them in special ways, invest them with a value that normal people otherwise reserve only for other people. Works of art mean something to us, not just the way statements do, but the way people do." End quote. Thus, we have viewers treating inanimate objects in the kind of interpersonal manner that I discussed in my essay vis-a-vis -vis artists in their studios, where paintings talk back to you or surprise you and finish themselves or direct your activity in some fashion. Critic Isabel Grau calls such phenomena vitalistic fantasies, as the inert object seems to become, in her words, a quasi-subject, assuming a life of its own. Grau introduces useful language to describe this spooky state of affairs, but does not probe its psychology. One can't, one can't help but wonder though, if we sometimes feel as if artworks are like people, who are these people? The inquiry into the workings of the human mind that Freud launched over a century ago has of course evolved dramatically, branched out and produced volumes and volumes of new theories and clinical examples to support them. Many of us remember the enthusiasm in the art world in the 1980s and 90s for Jacques Lacan's sometimes impenetrable writing, an enthusiasm spilling over from literary studies in the academy. Less familiar in this country are the contributions of the British School of Object Relations, including a whole body of literature on the origins of creativity and on aesthetic experience. Foundational for this branch of psychoanalysis was the work of child analyst Melanie Klein, who shifted away from Freud's emphasis on the drives to focus on an individual's interpersonal or object relations, actual and symbolic, and especially on the infant mother dyad in all its intense ambivalence. Freud neglected this primal bond in his preoccupation with Oedipal struggles, but for Klein and her followers, the early relationship to the mother formed the centerpiece in a theory of normal emotional growth and creativity. From her clinical work with small children, Klein postulated in the infant a realm of unconscious fantasy made up of mental representations or inner objects acquired through a series of identifications and introjections. First of part objects, the breast, mother's hands, arms, and then eventually of whole persons, foremost the parents. These objects perceived by the child as either good and nurturing or bad and threatening inspire love on the one hand, hatred on the other. Gripped by fear or rage, the needy infant imagines biting, tearing, destroying the bad objects. Such hostile, omnipotent fantasies, according to Klein, lead to overwhelming remorse when the child ultimately realizes that the good 
bad objects are one and the same. According to Klein, this feeling gives rise in unconscious fantasy to a desire to repair the damaged objects and to rebuild the ruined inner world. She referred to this state as the depressive position. Overcoming it, imaginatively reestablishing the internal good objects leads to integration and an increasing reconciliation of inner and outer realities. Klein saw this destructive, reparative dynamic and acted in child's play during her analytic sessions. She took play seriously as an emotionally meaningful symbolic activity. Moreover, the destructive reparative dynamic that originates in relation to the maternal body and the child's inner world in a period before language may be symbolically reenacted in the artistic process. At issue seems to be recurring, alternating compulsions to do damage to one's inner objects, and then to rebuild that dilapidated inner world. This puts a whole new spin on Penelope at her loom. It also helps explain the rhetoric of violence that sometimes informs accounts of the creative process. Picasso's famous definition of the picture as a sum of destructions. Collage o offers, I think, the most obvious enactments of the unconscious, destructive, reparative dynamic. Tearing and cutting elements, which are then reassembled into a new totality. Rarely does one associate art making with murder, but Robert Motherwell shockingly observed in a 1965 interview that, quote, tearing the paper in collage is like killing someone, end quote. After committing the imaginary crime, the artist may think, oh, what have I done? And then proceed to resurrect his victim or victims and reintegrate and revitalize them in the finished work of art. One could choose from any number of examples of such symbolic assaults. Lee Krasner masochistically cutting up and cannibalizing her own earlier drawings in the 1970s and applying the fragments to new canvases. I think Lucio Fontana's surgical cuts may be among the most disturbing manifestations. I think our visceral reaction to his work is a powerful indication, if you'll forgive me for stating the obvious, of our empathic identification with the art object. More about that momentarily. Invariably, Fontana makes reparative amends for his precise and merciless wounding of the canvas by then enshrining and exalting it as art. Given my preoccupation with this line of interpretation of the artistic process, you might understand my reaction to the scene of cutting as drawing in her words that Pat Boas showed us in her Creative Industries talk on November 16th. This project, as you'll recall, involved ripping pages and pages of gallery ads out of art magazines and cutting away the text, symbolically attacking the art market and all its hype, yielding in the process color sheets with gaping holes. These fragments then became the raw material for new configurations, a series of digital prints in which the fragments are rearranged and reintegrated into an altogether new and different whole. The torn edges 
remain visible, but are made seamless and smooth by the photographic process. Boaz's scanned collages are composed in both senses of the word, that is composed, made up of parts, as well as composed as a person's behavior may be composed, any unruly emotions held in check. These words, works for me, literalize the symbolic layers and layers of possible meaning in any successful work of art. In 2014, Jacqueline Humphreys told Mark Godfrey in Art Forum, I know I have to destroy the painting that I know in order to make the one I don't know yet. Along with Humphreys, Godfrey interviewed painters Charlene von Heil, Laura Owens, and Amy Silman, all of whom, according to Godfrey, described the procedure of making a painting as a confrontation, a violation, a compulsive undoing, sabotage, transgression, and so on. You might think their work would be all blood and gore, but no, because often what's being attacked is not the material of art nor the subject, but rather a tradition, a hierarchy, a convention, or the artist's own successful previous tendencies. Outrage or a wish to do damage may play a part, but in the finished work, Freud would have pointed to a sublimation, Melanie Klein to a reparation. One of Klein's adult analysands was the painter, art historian, and critic Adrian Stokes, whose several books include Painting and the Inner World. Stokes understood the importance in British object relations of the infant mother dyad and related issues of fusion and separation, how the newborn is unaware at first of his discrete self, but eventually begins to recognize mother as a separate being with an inner life of her own. An unconscious memory of this uncanny realization of another person with her own mysterious inner workings may lie at the root of the artist's otherwise irrational feelings about the artwork in progress as a living thing, independent of the artist's own will. For Stokes, the recollection has implications for the viewer as well. He proposed that painting's formal presentation in, induces our contemplative engagement in part because it unconsciously evokes our earliest relation to mother, the breast situation, as he calls it, in which the nursing infant gazes at mother and recognizes there the me and the not me, a separate body, another being in intimate connection with the developing self. A faint recollection of this condition of fusion and incipient separation can, I think, help us understand those preposterous claims about how the viewer becomes one with the painting. For example, the German aesthetician, Theodore Lipsch's late 19th century theory of Einfühlung or empathy, in, in which if the art is beautiful, the observer fuses with the object observed. Or in the 20th century, the great connoisseur Bernard Berenson's insistence that aesthetic experience includes feeling one with the work of art. The sense of fusion carries with it a potential threat to one's autonomy, yet in contemplating the work of art, we know that we're safe, 
the experience is virtual, not real, and the surrender is only temporary. The dim mother memories that may underlie this kind of aesthetic emotion are beautifully brought out by Mark Rothko's biographer, James Breslin, in his discussion of the artist's mature paintings. It was in the year following his mother's death, Breslin reports, that Rothko arrived at his unique format, that is of the diaphanous floating rectangles of color. In these paintings, Breslin explains how, quote, Rothko does not represent the literal mother as he did in one of his earliest paintings. Instead, he produces a kind of painting that will, through its interactions with a viewer, recreate the reciprocity, reciprocities and tensions of an infant's earliest relation with a nurturing parent. His weightless, softly edged rectangles seem to lift off the canvas and advance towards the viewer, activating the literal space between the painting and the viewer, filling it with a large, commanding, and seductive presence, which, enveloping and comforting, threatening to engulf and discomforting, recreates the play between separation and absorption of early psychic life. Rothko's presences evoke the maternal body, his capacity to draw on such deep psychic experience provides his abstract and vacant works, vacant that is a figuration, with the core of human content that he always insisted they contained, end quote. Again, the sense of merging with the object recalls the condition in which the discrete ego was still in formation while the infant was only gradually discovering an autonomous existence. It's a paradoxical state which flows from an original material biological reality and for which Klein's disciple D.W. Winnicott theorized the idea of potential space. Winnicott was the most influential analyst vis-a-vis -vis theories of creativity and understood a continuum between the child's symbolic play analyzed by Melanie Klein and the, genuine, the genuinely artistic activity of adults, which requires contributions from all developmental levels, including as analyst John Ghetto has observed, the more advanced sectors of the personality, as well as levels of affectivity or emotion related to the era before the unification of the self as a psychic entity. Most notable about Winnicott's theories are the phenomena of transitional space and transitional objects. He noted a stage in the infant's life of hallucinatory wish fulfillment. The child is hungry, wishes for the breast, and the mother, arriving at just the right time, gives him the illusion that he has created the breast for his own satisfaction. Winnicott calls this misconception the primary illusion of omnipotence. Without it, the child cannot enjoy reality. This illusion is the origin of transitional space, the space between dream and reality, inside and outside. And from it arises the possibility of transitional objects, which the child adopts for his own comfort and consolation. The teddy bear, the bit of blanket, which substituting for mother are paradoxically both hallucinatory wish fulfillments and at the same time, real objects enlisted from the external world. Winnicott urged us to accept 
the paradoxical status of the transitional object. It is at once creative on the part of the child, symbolic, and a material object, both invented and found. Winnicott describes a subsequent stage of playing, and for this to proceed optimally, he says that a good play space has to exist. That is, the potential space between the mother and the child, where the child's imagination can reign free, reality can be tested, and mother is available if need be. Analyst Susan Derry has explained the importance in this situation of the mother and child looking at each other. The child internalizes the image of the mother's approving gaze. I believe this recollected approving gaze may be what the artist unconsciously anticipates from the viewer. Karen Sullivan's research on how artists at work in their studios conceptualize an audience for their work, research that I cited in my catalog essay, suggests that abstract artists for the most part focus on a dialogue with the object itself. Still, the anticipated viewer always lurks in the back or even the front of the artist's mind. The studio reincarnates the potential space between the playing child and what Winnicott, Winnicott calls the environmental mother, not interfering, but supportively looking on. The artist may be alone in the studio, but his or her interest in a future viewer's response implies a preconscious awareness of an interpersonal ambiance in which artist, the artwork, and viewer form an interactive matrix. Psychoanalyst Harry Trosman observes that the artist engaged in a creative task works in the presence of an internalized object, at once a muse who may inspire the work and or the person to whom it is addressed. Although such an object may in reality refer back to earlier surrogates, read mother, in the context of artistic creation, that object is the sensitive viewer. In my own experience, I find this concept extremely apropos, an interactive matrix consisting of the artist, his or her inner objects, the work of art, and the receptive viewer, more often than not a complete stranger to the artist. It is an interpersonal relationship without words, and one might even call it intimate. In a chapter on abstraction and intimacy in his book, What Do Pictures Want?, Tom Mitchell wonders, can abstract painting participate in politics? Yes, he concludes, not a straightforwardly polemical politics of propaganda, but a more subtle politics of intimacy that works across boundaries between public and private and opens new conversations within a fellowship of artists, objects, and beholders." End quote. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, if this is the end of your talk, um, we can stop sharing your screen and go into questions. Just like to look at these two paintings for a couple of more moments. They're so sure. fascinating to me. Well, I will, I'll respect your wishes. Well, we could leave that up for a little bit. And for everybody at home, um, you are able to unmute yourself and share your screen and ask Sue directly if you have any questions, or you can type them into the chat and I will read them aloud. And just to get us started, we do have one comment question in the chat. 
There is an intriguing aspect to Sarah Wurzberger's Wave Weave 2. It seems there is more to the curving framework than just to mirror the weave of the fiber art. Do you have any thoughts on this particular abstraction? Uh, who's asking the question? That is Alan Hicks. Alan. Um, Alan is a docent, as I recall, yes. and a collage artist. Yes. Can you um, elaborate a little bit on your observation, Alan, about the relationship of frame to what's going on inside the woven fabric? Um, Alan may have stepped away. Do you not see him in the group right now? Okay. Then, um, no, I don't have further thoughts on that. <laughs> what I stated in my catalog essay, but I would, I'm intrigued by what he might have to say about it. Um, but I'll, I, I guess we'll leave that for later. Okay. Um, okay. Once again, anybody at home with any questions? Well, I have not so much a, a question, I guess, as just a comment. Um, I always find it interesting to meet the artist after I see their artwork and find out with this show, it does definitely seem like the conversation is more of an internal one and that the artwork very much reflects the people that I've met. I, you know, as opposed to indie folk, um, whereas maybe the artists were having more of a conversation with the audience, with things outside of themselves. And it, it changes the way um, I put the artwork together with the conversations that it make. So I guess kind of my question for you, Sue, um, how, when you're writing about an artist, how much time and consideration do you take of that actual person as opposed to the artwork? You know, how do you make that separation? Um, sometimes it's impossible to make, but in general, it's really the work that I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot to say about that too. Um, at the opening, of Sensate Objects when we were outside the museum and Scott handed me the microphone. I didn't anticipate having to say anything, but I just blurted out everything that I've learned, I've learned from artists. And that's not quite the case. I've done a lot of reading, you know, I've learned from all my, my teachers, but um, and an invitation to an artist studio is, is a real honor and a privilege for me. And I've been getting those in, in invitations since graduate school. In fact, in graduate school, um, I was toying with um, focusing on Renaissance art, but I was exposed to MFA students who were also working on their degrees at UFC at Midway Studios, who, kept inviting me. We met each other through certain um, seminars that we had to take in common. And from that moment on, I became fascinated uh, with the artistic process. In general, um, and this, this catalog essay was, um, it was a good example because I, I had met, I knew Pat Boas, I had met Petra Saarinen, but I did not know her well. And I had not met Sarah Wurzberger, even though she lives in Portland. And I had no idea who the other artists were. So um, ultimately we're all thrown back on the work of art. Um, and of course, if you, if you cultivate an artist over years, and if the artist takes the trouble to educate you about what they're up to, precious, precious insights ensue into their interests, what they're reading, what they're up to. A lot of the information that um, 
I presented in this talk based on bibliography that artists have given me. So um, I don't know, that's, a, that's the best I can do in answer to your question. If, if the artist um, makes the effort to educate a critic, something good can come of it. Uh, not necessarily immediately, but down the road, yeah. it can happen. Uh, thank you, Sue. That's a really wonderful point to make for any of our young aspiring artists um, watching this today or watching it after we get it up on our website, as many of them do, is informing them to not be scared of the critic, to introduce yourself, to start a conversation and perhaps an invitation to the studio, whether it's welcomed or not, um, to continue to pursue that dialogue. Um, One of the, I, I think it's so important, although maybe not so much as it once was because um, the venues for critics writing have uh, dried up. They're not what they once were. But um, I recall when I lived in Chicago and had a column in the Sun-Times and was writing for both Art News and Art in America, artists would call me all the time, come and see what I'm doing, come to my studio, meet me at my exhibition. And yes, um, I've learned a lot from that. On one occasion, um, an artist that I had only met but did not know well presented an exhibition that I reviewed for the Sun-Times. And she called me afterwards and said, you know, um, I really appreciate that you wrote about my show, but you really didn't get it. Why don't you come over to my studio and I'll show you the context for what I'm working on. And I thought that that was just the most appropriate and extraordinary, extraordinarily mature way to handle a situation. I have heard other artists say, oh, well, how dare they <laughs> get all indignant and, um, and hold grudges for years and years. So I always shared that experience with my students vis-a-vis -vis a potential relationship that one can develop with a critic. As I always say, and I'll say it again, um, it's up to artists to educate critics. Thank you, Sue. We have a question in the chat from Martin. Martin has written, how does Walter Benjamin fit into your analysis of artist-viewer interaction and his focus on aura? Oh, not too much. Um, that essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, was um, important during the 1980s when there were a lot of artists working with um, photo-derived images, image appropriation, et cetera. I always incorporated that essay into my teaching, but it doesn't come to, um, to mind when I'm looking at art on my own. Thank you, Sue. We might have time for one more question. If there's anybody at home who would like to unmute themselves or type something into the chat. If not, uh, I would like to thank you, Sue, for working with us and contributing this wonderful essay to Mel Prest's curated group exhibition, Sensei Objects. And thank you so much for this extraordinary talk. I feel as though I've learned new things myself um, and you have reminded me of other things I need to tap back into. And thanks for that little surprise at the very end where you showed a most recently completed painting of mine uh, next to Mel Prest, uh, which I think speaks to the many hats we all wear and uh, what we do to advocate for the arts. Thank you so much, Sue. What I am... Um... What I have come to think of now as a fellowship of artists and viewers. So thank you for everything that you do on behalf of all of us. Thank you, Sue. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful day.